Let's see here. It's preparing to live stream. Oh, meeting is now live streaming on YouTube. Is it really? It should be as soon as you press the button. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See you here. Wow, I'm gonna get a double feedback here. Yeah, you have to you have to turn the audio off on the YouTube channel. Yeah, I just turned uh, I just turned the whole YouTube off. So Mitch is Mitch is watching over there, and you see both of us, Mitch, on YouTube. Yep. Great. Amazing. Hey, Robert. I know I just said hi to you 15 minutes ago when I welcomed you into the Zoom room, but I'm super excited to chat with you today and pick your brain. Um, for anybody who is watching live on YouTube or who is watching this recording in the future, um, Robert Pavlis is a super busy guy, a super interesting guy. He's an artist. He's an author of multiple works, including Soil Science for Gardeners, which I'm going to be uh, chatting with him about today, although I'm sure we'll, we'll stray to some other things that he's been working on as well. He's a videographer. He's got a YouTube channel of his own. I think it's called Garden Fundamentals. Yes. Right? That's the channel. Uh, maybe Mitch can, can compile some of these links and he'll put them in the chat and in the YouTube description as well. He's also the owner and designer of um, the tiny garden, the six acre Aspen Grove uh, Gardens in Guelph, I'm assuming, there, Ontario, there where you live. Yes. Um, and he's an educator as well. And he's got a number of courses up online. I'm not sure if those are, are live courses or static online courses. Um, no, they're, they're, they're a combination of both. Um, so some are statics. Um, and then I do a number of live ones every year for the university. I do some for the University of Guelph through the Arboretum. And I do uh, a garden design through from the city of Guelph. And that was done virtually this year. It's usually done live, but uh, because of COVID, we did it virtually. And we had uh, uh, some 800 people sign up for that one. Amazing. Kind of interesting. Yeah, so... Great Anything to do with gardening, gardening and garden design is out there. there. <laughs> yeah, so um, this, this whole episode is brought to you by Verge Permaculture. Um, that is my, my employers, super blessed to be working for them and New Society Publishers, um, of which my employers, Rob and Michelle, are authors, as well as Robert Pavlis. Um, New Society Publishers has really set the bar for a publishing house in my eyes. Uh, they've been in business for about 40 years, providing activist solutions oriented publishing. Um, they, um, you know, most of most of the works on their website are about um, climate change, making the world a better place. Um, they have a commitment to build an ecologically sustainable and just society and they walk their talk. Um, by doing all their printing within North America, never overseas, and on 100% post-consumer recycled paper. And they've been uh, carbon neutral since 2006. The employees are all shareholders, and they are a certified B corporation. So thank you, New Society. Thank you, Verge. And thank you, Robert, for joining me here today. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, very cool. And for anybody who doesn't know who I am, my name is Ben Dunn. It probably says on the little Zoom window on the bottom left there. Um, you may recognize me as a TA from the OPDC. Mitch has been, he's sitting here next to me. He was the host in the past and um, I've been taking over because he's just running out of time to in, doing too many other cool things. So here we are. Um, Robert, yeah, how do I even start? I have so many questions for you. Maybe, maybe I'll ask you how you got into gardening. Like what, what was your first garden? When was your first garden? Well, my first sort of garden was in university when I didn't have a garden. So I started collecting cactus and pretty quickly I had about 150 cactus growing in the apartment. <laughs> and then uh, I, we, we finally got a house with a small garden. So then I got interested in vegetable gardening and, and general gardening. Uh, then I got into orchids, and at one point I had over a thousand orchids growing in the house. Yeah, um, that's not a really good idea. Uh, they produce a lot of humidity, and it's not good for the house. <laughs> but I just went nuts with orchids for 10, 15 years. And then uh, I was getting a little older, and we're getting closer to looking at retirement, so we decided to move out to this current property. So we 
specifically look for a place that I could do some real gardening. So we ended up buying this six acre property and I'm turning it into a botanical garden. Wow. Um, it's a private, it's a private botanical garden, but uh, it's just my place to play around. So I've always had plants ever since university, really. Um, and if I didn't have any ground to grow in, I used pots. And as soon as I got some uh, space outside, I, I, I went outside. <laughs> And uh, when you said we we bought Aspen Grow Gardens, was that you and uh, you and a partner? Well, I'm I'm married. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, interestingly, she knows nothing about gardening. Doesn't you care about you, gardening. All of these years, we we have this rule that anything inside the house is her domain, and everything outside is mine, and uh, we don't argue that way. So she'll tell me she doesn't like things outside. You know, she doesn't like she hates magnolias, for instance. Hmm. but she can't really criticize those because they're outside yeah not her domain uh, but she doesn't garden so she loves walking around the garden and loves going out into it but uh we kind of keep it separate that way and uh that way we don't fight so much <laughs> yeah whatever works um it's sad to see that more people aren't gardeners i mean i grew up in a garden uh, my grandmother um gardened prolifically she had all kinds of beautiful flowers growing um as well as she she had a small hosta business so every year i was there splitting potting and and driving hostas in a trailer to nurseries with her and i guess my first job was probably pulling weeds out of the garden for for a penny a weed <laughs> and i remember splitting the weeds to try and get extra pennies and make that extra buck but there's something so special about being out there in a garden and helping things grow and like having all this abundance around you at least that's something that i've always loved yeah. about gardening and it's sad to see that it's not more of a of a, a bigger cultural value at least in you know cities like guelph toronto where i'm from or, or calgary you don't see many gardens yeah i i think gardeners think that gardening is very popular you know and we go to the nursery and it's crowded and so on we think it's popular but I don't know what the number is, but I, I would guess maybe 10% of the people garden, if that. Um, and mo ma many people will have a garden because they bought a house and they're sort of forced into gardening, right? They have to have a lawn and a couple of shrubs and some tulips. So they'll, they'll just learn enough to kind of keep the place looking decent. And that's the end of gardening. They really know nothing about plants or gardening and don't really care as long as the property looks nice. Yeah. And it is kind of sad because uh, there's, an, there's an opportunity to learn a lot and get involved with nature. And, uh, but to be honest, most people aren't interested in that, right? Everyone has busy lives. They have other interests. And uh, there's a small group of us who are kind of fanatics about gardening. <laughs> yeah, all of my, I mean, I'm not a, a super avid gardener myself. I've had gardens like yourself since university. One year I had, I was renting this place in Kelowna. I went to UBC um, Okanagan in Kelowna for a, a degree in psychology and anthropology. And I had a place with a really big backyard. And I was like, heck, I'll grow a garden, plant some tomatoes, potatoes, beets, whatever. And it sucked. Like it was a really bad garden. I didn't know how to do anything. Um, but coming from a background in, in psychology, um, especially um, positive psychology in nature and well-being, like there's some good science to show that being out in nature will actually improve your well-being um, and sense of connectedness to, to the world around you. Um, yet, you know, people have a house with, with a property, front yard, backyard, and they just spend all, all the time in, inside those walls. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's unfortunate. Anyways, um, to move more into your book, Soil Science for Gardeners, um, for anybody who hasn't read this book, it's an absolutely amazing book. And we're actually um, giving away a copy of, of this book to one um, engaged YouTube person in the chat there. So, you know, ask lots of questions, stay engaged and you might win. And for everybody else, uh, we are, um, there is a coupon code where you can get uh, Robert's book for 20% off from New Society uh, for the next three days. 
and Mitch is here sitting next to me. He's going to put the coupon code in the chat. Um, everything you need to know about soil is in this book. The first section is all about understanding soil, what's in it, what you need to know. The second part is about soil issue, issues and then solutions. And the third part is all about how to understand your site specific soil. So I want to start by asking you, what is soil? What is soil? Well, see here, here I disagree with many people. So you'll see lots of people who say soil is a living. And uh, I, I really hate when I hear that because by definition, soil is not living. It includes the sand, silt and clay and it includes the dead organic matter. Mm. And that's really not a up for discussion. That's how it's defined. Okay, then it's been defined that way for you know 200 years or maybe longer. So that's what soil is. Now there is something called a soil ecosystem, which is the whole thing, right? Including all the living organisms, all the plants, the trees, the perennials, the insects, the bugs, everything. That's the ecosystem. And we can talk about the ecosystem, but if you're going to talk about soil, it, it really is not living. And the reason why that is important, I think, is that as soon as people think soil is living, they start creating a whole bunch of images about soil which are incorrect. And there's a whole bunch of myths going around, like we have to feed the soil. Well, you, you really don't have to feed the soil because it's not living. It doesn't need to eat, right? Um, so you understand soil much better if you accept the fact that it's not living, right? And there's an analogy I use that um, I'm not sure how many people actually appreciate it. Um, but we walk around in air and there's bacteria in the air and there's fungi in the air, uh, there's plants growing in the air, but we don't talk about air as being living, mm. right? Air is, is not living. And yet the same thing happens in soil and suddenly soil is living. Okay, so soil is kind of the equivalent of air. Both are dead and there's living organisms in it, but the material itself is not living. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting and important distinction because in the same way that soil is not living but provides uh, space for life and as part of this ecosystem, air functions in that same way in you know, mammals, right. reptiles, animals, plants breathe air. And like you said, there's other things within this ecosystem, but yeah. it's, it's inert, but it is part of an, an ecosystem. So that's, that is an interesting distinction. But then would you um, place a distinction between soil and dirt? Well, uh, the definition of dirt, uh, I don't know what the official definition is, but my definition is, is that's the stuff on your shoes and on your clothes and the dust in your house, that's dirt. Mm. So outside, we don't have dirt. We have soil. Yeah. Uh, inside the house, you have dirt and you, you sweep it up and get rid of it. Okay. So dirt really shouldn't be applied outside. Oh. <laughs> That stuff is too important and too precious to us to call it dirt. <laughs> wow, I like that. It is, it is so important and so precious. And I wish more people understood the value of, of healthy soils because without soil, we are all dead. We We're all dead. Just, We're definitely dead, yeah. Okay. In fact, a number of years ago, I was asked by the university to develop a gardening course for the general public. So it was going to be run through the university, but it's not a university course. It's a general public gardening course. And I sat down and said, okay, you know, we're going to talk about trees and perennials and grasses and weeds and stuff. And what else should we talk about? And I went to my library and I pulled out two big books. And these were all like six, 700 page gardening books. Uh, one happened to be called Canadian Gardening. Um, one had three pages about soil in the very back chapter, and the other had nothing about soil. And that just that just threw me. And I said, "Well, this is this doesn't make any sense." So I designed this course. It's a six-part course, and the first part is all about soil. Mm. And 
it's the most important thing. If, if gardeners understood the soil and what goes on in the soil, the rest of uh, gardening becomes so simple um, because everything's based on that. And new gardeners don't learn about the soil. And I understand that. I'm a new gardener. I want pretty flowers. And I understand that. That makes sense. I want to see things. I want to eat things, right? I want carrots and, and blueberries. I don't care about soil. I want something about plants. But as those gardeners get more experienced, they reach a point where they say, geez, you know, that soil is really critical. And every time I have a problem, it, it's either bugs or soil. Mm -hmm. And if I get the soil right, I grow better plants and it's easier to grow plants. So at some point in that development of the gardeners, they reach a point where they say, you know what, soil is really important. I, I better sit down and learn about it, right? Unfortunately, that doesn't happen early enough. Um, but I, I understand why it, you know, the, the average gardener doesn't care. They only want the flowers. If something blooms, that's, that's great. That's all I need to know, <laughs> right? But when we think about it, um, when we're talking about growing things, we kind of can only control three things. Uh, one is the light. And we don't have much control over that. I mean, I can put a plant in shade or in sun, but whatever the sun gives me, that's the light I've got. I, I really have no control over it. If we're, if you're in Calgary, you, you have, you know, longer days in the summer and shorter days in the winter. If you're down in Florida, you know, you have the same days all year round. You can't control that. So then there's water and we really can't control water too much either. I mean, sure, we can add a bit extra here and there, but the main water source comes from the sky. And we don't have any control over it. So what's left? Well, it's the soil. It's the thing that's holding up our plants. And we can control the soil and we can do things to the soil to improve plant growth. But the other things we really can't control, we can't control the air, for instance. Uh, we usually don't have to because there's lots of CO2 in the air and we can ignore it. Temperature, light, all those things we have very little control over, but we can control soil. So we have to understand it. I love that you mentioned all of that because I know um, as humans, we love to kind of force functions. And to me, that's so evident in the fact that we plant and farm these giant monocultures all across North America, North America and around the world, like corn, soy, like all those big monoculture crops. It's the same formula trying to plug and play in different environments, different ecosystems, different soil structures, different light, you know, different water. And we just think, okay, we'll just copy and paste this everywhere but you you can't do that you have to well i mean you can but it's going to come back and it's going to bite you in the ass mm -hmm. um and so you have to understand what what your site is offering you and how you can work with that and um working for a permaculture design company and, and having somewhat of a background in, in permaculture myself how, how familiar are you with with permaculture um, a little bit yeah. i'm not well versed in it yeah. Um, so, I mean, a big, a big part of permaculture is, is needs and yields. Um, so, you know, let's say you have high, high clay soils, your, your soil will need different things than if you have high, high silt or like a high loam, or if you have low light or high light. And I guess to me, one of the fun things about, about gardening is, is learning to work with your, your site and what it's offering you and how, you can you can build the soil to um, work with the plants in that area yeah it's one of the things gardeners love to do is to fight their their soil right fight the conditions so we 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 plant things that want a different ph than we have mm. and then we we ask well how do i change the ph right mm. or we put things in that want to be very moist and we put them in a dry spot and then we wonder well what do i do to make them grow and and lots of times on social media people ask questions like that i say well don't don't bother like don't you don't fight it right mm -hmm. figure out what you have and then pick plants that grow there mm -hmm. and for lots of people not everybody but for lots of people 
there's quite a wide range of plants that will grow in whatever you have. <clears throat> and if you pick the right plants for that, it makes gardening so much easier. Mm. Um, and in my garden, I mean, I grow some like 3000 different plants. Amazing. And I don't change the soil for any of them. I don't change the pH for any of them. I do plant some things in the sunny area and some things in the more shady area because that's important. Almost nothing I grow gets watered unless we have a serious drought. And you know what? They don't all grow. Some die, right? And those plants don't belong here. Mm -hmm. So I replace them because there's so many other things you can grow. Like don't fight things that don't grow for you. Yeah. Um, and I think new, particularly new gardeners, they're, they pick the plants again, they're back, they're plant focused. So they pick the plants first, they put them in and then they try and figure out how to make the thing grow. You know, um, I had a lady the other day talking about a lilac that wasn't doing very well. It's been in there for two or three years and she just wanted this lilac to perform while she was growing it in a real heavy shade, right? Wrong plant, wrong place. No matter what she did, she was never going to be successful, right? Yeah. She should have started right from the beginning. And it wasn't actually her fault. The nursery just gave her bad advice. But she needed to pick something that grows in the spot she has, and then she can be successful with that plant, right? You cannot fight mother nature um, at least not very much we can we can help along a little bit we can improve that soil but we can't change light and water and all those other conditions we can't change ph for the most part right uh fighting ph is is sort of a never-ending battle in fact i someone was here today and i was showing him a i grew a one snake bark maple which likes acidic soil and i just really love it and but I have put sulfur around it every year, mm. right? And how long does that last? Well, I have to do it every year for the rest of my life. I mean, that's really a stupid decision to put that in. Like, why would you do something like that? All right? I don't grow rhododendrons and azaleas. I don't grow blueberries. I love blueberries, but mm. I don't grow them because they don't grow in my soil. It's, my soil is slightly alkaline, right? Um, don't fight the soil... Um, don't fight the conditions that you don't have. Find yeah. plants to fit. Yeah. I love that. That was, that was very well said. And, and a lot of what I've learned um, in, in my own education within permaculture would, would you know, all the permaculture gods are, cla are clapping their hands at that because it's like, yeah, you have to work with, with what you got. Um, I'm curious to know um, how you learned everything you did, you know, you said you started your first garden in, in university. Um, I don't know if you, you studied something um, garden related or ecology related, or if this has all been your own experience along your way. My background is in chemistry. So I have a chemistry degree and a master's in biochemistry. And that gives me a good grounding for understanding a lot of these things. Uh, I, I did a fair amount of biology, not a huge amount, uh, and the rest of it is all self-learned. So I've, I've never actually been in the business of growing plants. Mm. There's always been a hobby. Yeah. Uh, my business is actually in software development, running businesses and marketing. Oh, wow. So that's, you know, like that's way over the other end of the spectrum here. And plants have always just been a hobby. But I find that if you take the time and, and learn all this, and then of course spend years practicing it, you, you'll learn it. Mm. Um, but I think it's important to take kind of a scientific approach to these things, especially today. The biggest problem we have today is that there's way too much information about any subject, yeah. but we're talking gardening. So way too much information. And there's, all kinds of social media groups for gardening. And some of them are quite good and many of them are really bad. And I just cringe when I see the stuff that's being promoted on some of these sites. Uh, it's just completely wrong, but people write it 
And everyone assumes that everybody on those social media groups is an expert, so they believe it. And so it, in some ways, it's harder to learn gardening today than it was 50 years ago. Yeah. Because 50 years ago, you, you had to get a book. There was no other options. And it was hard writing books. Like you couldn't just publish them online, like through Amazon and so on, right? Anybody can be a publisher today. In fact, I have a couple of books on, on Amazon too that I self publish So I know anybody can publish a book and know absolutely nothing about the subject matter. Uh, but that didn't happen, you know, 30, 50 years ago. You, you had to be an expert to get a publisher. It was a long process and so on. So most books were reasonably good. But today you get on there, you got blogs. I mean, there's, there's YouTube channels where every YouTube I see is wrong. Wow. And they're giving all kinds of advice on what you should do in the garden. And it, I just cringe. And it's really hard today for a new gardener to weed through that because it all sounds so legitimate. Like here's this expert. He's got 200 videos already under his belt who tells you how to grow things. And turns out he hasn't got a clue what he's talking about. Right. Yeah. So it's so hard to sift through that and, and actually learn the right thing. So um, I, I guess the solution is you really have to spend time figuring out who you want to listen to and pick a few good people. There are some really good people online. Um, who would you, who would you recommend for, for myself people? for, for first yeah. of all, <laughs> and why wouldn't that? I? Um, so um, uh, there's, there's another fellow i'm not gonna think of his name now uh, out of england um who does a lot of vegetable gardening um oh oh charles dowding charles dowding yeah. okay like I, I watch one of his videos and you know rarely do i find something on that where i would say that's wrong yeah right i i may not agree about something but it's kind of one of those iffy things that we could both be right right yeah. But he's, he's rarely saying something that's just completely wrong. Um, another one in, gar in Canada that's uh, uh, quite good is the Laid Back Gardener. The Laid Back Gardener? Yeah, he has a blog. He, he publishes a blog every day. Wow. Which is mind-blowing. And I read his blogs from time to time. I mean, I, I know a lot of the material, but if I, I read one, there's very seldom when I can say he, he made a mistake. Yeah. Right. It's, it's always right. Another really good uh, person I trust a lot is Lee Reich. And he's written uh, at least one book for New Society. And I think he's got a second book in the works for New Society. Um, but here. In fact, this is his book here, The Ever Curious Gardener. Mm. Okay. I like that. Um, I read through the book. I reviewed it on my, my blog, gardenmiss.com. And I read through everything in it. And I found, I think, three things where I wouldn't necessarily agree with him. But they were controversial, controversial issues. Like, I couldn't say he was wrong. I just don't agree with him, right? Yeah. And, I, and I told him that. And he says, yeah, well, you know, I, I think I'm right. You think you're right. So, mm. But uh, anything from Lee Reich... Uh, you can pretty much believe. Cool. Right. Uh, so there are some very good people out there. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's many who aren't. Um, and YouTube, unfortunately, is, is, is maybe one of the worst places to get information. There, there are some really bad people on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why I started the channel. I, I looked on YouTube sort of three, four years ago, and I thought, okay, let me look at the gardening material. And I found two things. One is the quality was pretty poor on a lot of stuff. And then there's just a bunch of people on there who are extremely popular, who know nothing about gardening. <laughs> okay, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, and then we're a couple of people who are really good, like Charles Dow Dowding on there has hundreds of videos. Um, uh, there's another fellow who stopped producing videos now who, who I would trust anything he said, right? Um, so it's a challenge. Uh, I think for a new gardener, you have to locate information that you somehow qualify and trust. 
right yeah it's it's i find it's especially challenging as well i mean I, being being a young guy in modern society and just observing how all of my friends and colleagues kind of move through the world um we have very short attention spans um, we want the information right away and we want to read a headline and you know what it is like i want you know sticking copper pennies in my monstera plant will get rid of whatever it's like those are the kind of things that that we like 15 second little tidbits of information rather than taking the time to actually um, delve into um, a topic and find those trustworthy people and, and to be able to weed through um, all of the garbage like you said it's it's challenging beyond gardening um, it seems Actually, I just thought of another fellow. He, he sort, he's not really a permaculturist, but he uses a lot of the techniques, and that's the Maritime Gardener. Mm-hmm. And he's a Canadian uh, uh, personality, too. He has a, a YouTube channel, and he has um, a blog, um, uh, podcast. And uh, again, very good information. Yeah. Uh, it's all about vegetable gardening in his case. Yeah. While we're referencing um, credible soil people, um, I'm a teaching assistant for an annual online PDC that Verge Permaculture runs. And um, Carmen Lamaru is one of the, the main instructors. And I'm sure you've probably never heard of her. She doesn't really have a big public presence, but man, does she know her shit and yeah. she she loves it. And it's it's just a joy to listen to her talk about soil which is such a funny thing but when someone is really passionate about something it's like yes i just want to listen to it all day long well soil is really interesting um and that's what you believe that and start learning about it it's 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 interesting and essential yeah so most of us go through our lives day to day walking on soil every day. Don't think twice about it. Could you paint a picture of what is actually going on beneath our feet in like a square foot of soil? Probably the most surprising thing for most people is that there are many, many more organisms under your feet than are above the soil. Mm. Right. So what you see as you're walking around, you, you, it, it looks like there's lots of stuff. I mean, we've got plants everywhere. We've got bugs everywhere. We have birds and large animals. Everything's running around. That's nothing compared to the quantity of organisms below your feet. Mm. So if, we, if you take a gram of soil, which is the equivalent weight of a paperclip, right? So it's a little speck in the palm of your hands. You've got a billion organisms in there. One billion with a, with a B at the front? With a B, yeah. Uh, you've, you've got uh, lots of bacteria. You've got fungi. You've got protozoas. You've got all kinds of algaes and all kinds of stuff in there. I mean, we're, we're talking not that's, – that's a reasonably good soil, okay? So if you really crappy soil, you won't have that. But if we have reasonable garden soil, let's say – easily a billion organisms in that speck of soil, Wow! right? So you can imagine how much you have in a square foot or a square yard of soil. Then the number just becomes so large. We, we, it makes no sense to humans, right? We can't visualize that kind of thing. And it's a wide range of things. The, what, what I find most interesting is that, you know, we've been studying soil for quite a few years now, uh, but we only know, we can only identify about 30% of those organisms. We don't, we don't know how many bacteria are in soil, like different species now, not quantity. Yeah. We can get a handle on quantity, but how many species of bacteria are in that soil? We, we don't know. We, we think there's 70% more than we've identified, okay. but we don't know comes the fungi, same thing. We've only identified a fraction of the fungi that are actually in that soil. Mm. Okay. So it's kind of like this uh, frontier 
of new species that we haven't investigated yet, right? And what's funny is that we, us gardeners, we, we talk about these organisms and soil as if we know everything, mm. right? And yet we, we haven't even identified 70% of what's there. Wow. Right? So we know things and we've learned a lot, but we, we have a long way to go in understanding what's actually taking place in there. When we're gardening, do you think we're gardening plants or gardening soil? Um, well, I, I guess that depends on, on who you are. Um, I, I'm growing plants, certainly. So my interest is growing weird stuff. Okay. So people ask me, what's your favorite plant? Well, it's the one I haven't grown yet. Okay. Yeah. It's the one that I haven't seen the flower yet. Maybe I've seen pictures, but I've never actually seen the flower. That's my favorite kind of plant. So I'm, I'm very much a plant person, a plantaholic. So I grow new stuff. It's all about the plants. And then once I've grown it for a few years, I kind of tire of it. Then I go on to something else, right? I, I love that new sense. But I do know that to grow those plants, I have to grow the soil. I have to keep working on the soil. Right. And I also know that improving your soil is a long term process. Mm. It's it's not something you're going to do in a couple of days. Um, so I'm focused on the plants today. But in back of my head, I know I if I want a better and better garden, I have to work on the soil at the same time. Yeah. Right? Um, I don't actually spend a lot of time improving my soil and mm. In, in some ways, I improve it less than I used to. Like when I first started gardening, I, I read the, all the books and it said, OK, you take your soil, you dig it up, you throw in some peat moss and you mix it all up and you do double digging and you do a bunch of other stuff. And I did all that, you know, and then I got a little smarter and learned a little more. And I realized, well, that, that's kind of a dumb thing to do. So my new gardens now, I, I basically kill the vegetation that's there and plant. I mean, I don't prep anything, um, but then long-term I do. So um, I don't compost anymore. I just throw everything in the garden, right? So if I go out and I'm, yeah, today we were out weeding and all the weeds are laying there in the garden. Yeah. And uh, the sun's out, they're going to bake for a couple of days. And then mother nature comes along and decomposes them right where they are, right? It, a, I mean, I have a large property now, so for me to haul all that stuff to one end and put it in piles and to turn it and so on is just too much work. Yeah. So I'm now at a point where I compost things, but almost nothing leaves my garden. So weeds and stem cuttings and dead flowers, everything goes back into the soil right away. And I mulch. So the mulch adds a little bit organic matter all the plant material that's there stays there. Mm. I try to keep all the soil covered all the time. So there's always something growing there. So that process is slowly improving that soil, right? I, I don't haul things away, except for rose clippings. It's the only thing, I have one green bin a year and that has the rose clippings in it because I know if I cut those and leave them on the ground, I'm gonna stick myself with them. <laughs> and I hate, rose thorns so i get one bin a year and i throw that to the city and everything else stays here <laughs> yeah a quote comes to mind um he said that and i think it's by masanobu fukuoku um and i'm probably going to botch the exact words but it's something along the lines of the the master gardener does accomplishes more and more by doing less and less until yeah. eventually you're doing nothing and you have this thriving abundant um property around you it sounds like that's that's kind of what you've accomplished. and that same philosophy goes for pests and diseases right the the new gardener comes along and says geez i got a little hole in my leaf let me post a picture on facebook what can i spray yeah right the the experienced gardener looks and says i don't see any holes <laughs> Mm. right a little hole is part of nature and we have to understand that uh, most bugs are good bugs 
So eight, somewhere around 80%. Some people say 90, some people say 70. I go with 80%. 80% of the bugs out there are good bugs and they eat the bad bugs. Yeah. If we don't have bad bugs, we can't have good bugs. Yeah. Okay, we have to have a bit of both. So when you have some aphids, you can look at it two ways. You can say, I have a big problem, what do I spray? Or you can say, you know what? That's a whole bunch of food for some sort of pest that's going to, some sort of insect that's going to come along and eat it like the lady beetles, right? Um, and if you leave it, the problem solves itself most of the time. Now, I, I understand people growing crops and so on. You know, if you have an acre of corn, you don't want something coming eating all your corn. Um, so growing uh crops is a little different because you know we we our income depends on that food um but even there you know we're learning that if you grow the crop next to a a, a, a bit of land that has a lot of weeds on it you're going to get less pests right you you have to have those good bugs nearby and we have to take care of those good bugs to take care of the pest bugs yeah. right so again, in my garden, I spray nothing, okay? If I have a real serious problem, something's getting a lot of mildew year after year, I throw it out and I get something else, right? Why would I fight that mildew? Um, same with uh, pests. I have viburnum beetle, destroys one of my viburnum bushes every year. And then one year it didn't. And never killed the tree. That was interesting. It would eat every leaf off this tree. And then by July, the leaves would all be back again and the pest is gone. And that happened year after year. And I just said, okay, well, have that tree. That's your tree. And it will die at some point. It didn't. It, it survived. And the last three years, I haven't seen a viburnum beetle. I, but I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to spray. I didn't have to you know, mix home remedies and stuff, which almost never work. I just, I just left it and somehow nature solved itself. I have no idea how I don't really care, except I didn't have to do anything to fix the problem. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's so much we can learn by just observing nature and mimicking the patterns found in nature. And one of the first things you notice is that Things take time. Things are moving very, very slowly. If you're looking for a quick, immediate fix, it's going to come with some consequences. Like if you're just pumping your soil full of liquid soluble fertilizers, um, you know, eventually, again, that's going to come and bite you in the butt because you're not encouraging those natural soil systems and ecosystems to develop and, and learn how to take care of themselves and develop the resiliency they need to make your life easier. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big believer in, in doing very little, but slowly improving the soil. Yeah. Right? So my soil now compared to 15 years ago is much better in, in my older gardens than it was back then. And but it's been a very slow process. You, you can't change soil quickly. Yeah. Right. Do you. Um... It sounds like you have a lot of perennial systems. Do you have a, a vegetable garden as well? Yes. Yeah. Got to have some vegetables. Yeah. How much <laughs> of, um, of your own um, sort of yearly yearly food supply are you, are you able to grow in your own garden? Um, well, there's a difference between are you able to and do you. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually grow a lot of that. I like my vegetables fresh. So we have a, a short season. So once tomatoes are ripe, I eat my tomatoes from there until frost. Yeah. But I used to take those and, and can them and preserve them. And, and I think that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But I've sort of been through that cycle and I'd rather do something else. Yeah. Uh, vegetable gardening is really popular right now, right? Because of COVID. So mm -hmm. last year, many, many people started growing their first vegetable garden and many people will do it again this year. And one of the things they're gonna learn is that growing vegetables is not easy. No. It's a lot of work. Uh, there's a, a number of issues. There's a lot to learn. It's not 
as simple as putting a plant in there and harvesting tomatoes. And so it will be interesting to see how many of those people actually stick around and, and still growing vegetables 10 years from now, right? Okay. Some will, some will, and uh, that's a good thing, but it's hard work. So I, you know, I grow enough for a few things and then come July and August, I can go to the market and buy things that other people have grown and I'm fine with that too. Yeah. Um, have you heard of Jeff Lawton? Yes, I have. Um, Jeff Lawton has a quote, I think that goes, all the world's problems can be solved in a garden. And I'm wondering if you have any, any comments on, on that quote. Uh, yeah, I've seen a similar quote just today. Um, it was actually someone written, something, uh, one of these memes on, on Facebook. Oh, you know, if we learn how to clean our water and grow our food, we've sort of solved all the world's problems. And um, I, I don't think that's really true. I, I think that the world we have today um, requires us to do a lot of other things. And there are certain a, a group of people who could live off the land and grow their own food and be quite self-sufficient. And that is a way of life. But unfortunately, society as a whole, if we look at the majority of people in society, they want more than that, right? Now, maybe, maybe the word more isn't quite correct because maybe they're asking for things which are actually worse, but whatever it is, they want other things. Yes. And we, we have to be realistic about what society really wants. And I find sometimes um, we're not very good at that. So there are a lot of people who don't want a garden. Yes, it'll be picked up by my secretary. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people in the world who don't want a garden. Um, they don't like to get their hands dirty. They don't want to learn about gardening. They're busy doing other things. And we have to accept the fact that that's okay too, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, we, we, it's a mistake for us to, as gardeners, to say, oh, we love this and everybody else has to love it too. Yes. For instance, we, we started before this program actually started, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, my wife doesn't garden, right? So she's in this environment that uh, a lot of gardeners, and, and let's be honest, most gardeners are females, right? Mm. They would love to be married to me and have a six acre garden. Right? <laughs> That's their dream husband here, at least as far as the gardening part goes. Yeah. Well, my, my wife doesn't garden, never has, has no interest. And there's a good percentage of the population like that. You know, we, we kind of accept it. Another thing I, I find uh, uh, interesting is things like lawns, for instance, right? So we get a lot of people saying, oh, let's get rid of the lawn and let the weeds grow and, and so on. And, and that's, that is a way of life and a, and a philosophy, if you like, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's probably the right way for us to go. But as a society, if we're going to be realistic about things, the majority of people want something simple. Yes. And grass is simple. Okay. It's relatively easy to teach someone how to grow grass. It's much more difficult to grow a wildflower meadow. Right. And so we have to be realistic. In fact, a number of years ago, I went to, to look into this and say, okay, what alternatives are there to a lawn? And yeah, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet, you know? So I, I tried to find a place that had trial gardens that had like, here's some grass and here's some clover and here's something else. Here's some vetch or whatever it is so that you could compare them. Do you know, I couldn't find such a garden in Ontario. Certainly. Hmm. I, I don't know of a garden like that. That compares like different, okay. well, like it looks like a lawn and acts like a lawn, but it's moss or it's clover. Yeah. I want to see what they look like. I want to see what they look like four years into it right? Yeah. They've been there for a while. What do they really look like? What, how, how, how do yeah. they really compare? It's very easy for someone to get on, on Facebook and say, oh, you should grow clover, get rid of the grass. Yeah, but but what does a clover lawn look like after four years? It, does it still look good, right? And I couldn't find anything. And the problem we have, I think, is that we have a, 
a small percentage of people who think we should get rid of lawn and replace it with other things. Yeah. And then we have 80% of the population who says, I, I don't want to learn how to garden anything other than grass. I know how to gr cut grass, right? So until we find a solution that's suitable for the 80%, we're not going to change the world. Right? We have to look at that realistically and say, if we're going to find a solution, we got to get a solution that 80% of the people will accept. Yeah. Yeah. The gardening has to be made more appealing, enticing, comfortable, easy to the larger population. Because yeah, like you said, it's, it's super easy to pull out the lawnmower, fill it up with gas and take one hour, two hours every week to mow your lawn. But, and I agree with you that that is the way that things are, but I mean, maybe I'm, I'm just one of those people that's like, rip up the lawns, plant the gardens. But hearing what, what you've um, been saying about how your perennial systems, your six acres of, of perennial systems now um, require very little effort at all. Um, you know, I, I would love to see more of that in, in a suburb. But, but you got to remember, I, I spent 50 years learning how to do that of to course, make it easier. You see, that's, that's, yeah. that's the catch. Right. And then it's like, where's the time that people are going to have to do that when they work 40 hours a week, they have families, they have, you know, societal responsibilities. And yeah. Yeah. How do you fit that in there? I mean, I, I agree. We, you know, we should have much less lawns. Um, I'm all in favor of that, but I'm also realistic enough to realize that telling people to get rid of their lawns isn't the solution. We have to show it to them. Yes. Right? So I, I actually, know the people at city so i i went to them and said you know i have a project for you and and there's actually a group in the city who's who's interested in the environment and so on so this is the right kind of group it, it's not the politician guys and i said why don't we take a new subdivision that has townhouses yes and we take every front yard and we plant it with something different yeah and then we see what happens. We monitor that over the next five years. And after five years, we can invite everybody in Guelph to go and look at these lawns and we can show them, look, this clover lawn looks just as good as the grass one beside it. And it really works. And here's how simple it is. You know what they told me? Screw we have up. a bylaw that says, when you put in a new townhouse, you have to lay sod. You cannot sell that townhouse without sod. That hurts. Yeah, doesn't that hurt? Yeah. I thought you got to be kidding me. Like, who's that stupid? That's well, frustrating. My city is that stupid. Um, I still think it's a good project, uh, and I'd love to see it. Well, then I started looking. I said, "Well, these alternative lawns—they got to be everywhere. Someone's got to have one of these." And there's an institute in Hamilton that promotes alternative lawn. They don't have a sample for you to go look at. They just have documents that tell you you should do it. Yeah. So uh, I know um, a new bylaw is being proposed in Toronto. You can face fines up to one hundred thousand dollars for allowing the growth of certain weeds in your lawn, or for letting your lawn go above a certain height. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me. Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I love that idea, though, of, of the subdivisions um, and experimenting with different, different lawns. One of my, like, super long-term later in career goals is to work with, with someone who does um, uh, sub-developments, like developing small communities and try and permaculture -fy that community. Um, I think Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton or Jeff Lawton were involved in a project in Los Angeles. Um, I think it was like, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, Village Homes, Mitch, do you know? Yeah, Mitch doesn't know either. Anyways, they did, they did exactly this. They, they reimagined community living, community spaces, a subdeveloped community. They planted a whole bunch of fruit trees and berry bushes and they had lots of ponds and water harvesting features and all of the houses were, were south facing to incorporate passive solar infrastructure so you weren't using unnecessary energy to heat and cool homes and 
in the summer and the winter. And to, to me, I mean, of course, this makes so much sense because I, I have now been in the permaculture space for about a year now, but to anybody outside the space, it's like too difficult, too much to think about, too expensive, not the most efficient use of space. Um, and yeah, like you said, it's like, of course, there will be people who just don't want to think about it at all. Um, and then there are the people who are going to be really excited about it and then having to strike a balance between those two. Yeah. So I kind of got distracted from asking you questions about your book because I had other questions for you. Um, so you have a book on garden myths, and I think we've talked about a couple, you know, garden myths here, common misconceptions. Um, but what are, what are, you know, the top three, let's say, um, myths that you run into? Um, when you're working with people? One of the really big ones, and this gets us back to soil, is using Epsom salts in the garden. So Epsom, and I find this really funny because Epsom salts, if you go and buy a package, it says right on there what it is. It says magnesium sulfate. Yeah. All it is is magnesium and sulfur. Okay. So we know what's in it, but people use it for all kinds of things in the garden. So pest control, disease control, it doesn't do any of those things. Uh, people use it to stop blossom end rot on tomatoes. Okay. Well, we used to think blossom end rot was a calcium deficiency, which is, is not, we know that now, but even if it was a calcium deficiency, how would adding magnesium solve that problem? Yeah. Okay. In fact, it turns out if you add too much magnesium to soil, it actually ties up the calcium and you can actually cause blossom end rot. Now, I don't think most people are adding enough to do that, but it is potentially possible. So it turns out blossom end rot is a watering issue. It has nothing to do with any of that. So the magnesium sulfate they're using simply doesn't work. There's there's zero reason to use it in the garden, Hmm. except... If your soil is really deficient in magnesium, then it will help a little bit. But it's an awfully expensive way to find magnesium. There's much cheaper sources of magnesium. So Epsom salts does not belong in the garden, and yet it's recommended so many times. Um, Other big myths are things about fertilizing. We People really don't understand fertilizers. And we can talk about synthetic fertilizers or organic fertilizers, and there's lots of myths about these things. Probably the biggest one is that when the organic material gets decomposed, it ends up being very simple ions, what chemists call ions, right? So nitrate, phosphate, potassium, uh, chlorine, these are all ions. And once they're in solution, that's how plants can absorb them. Mm. As as large molecules, plants can absorb them. So if I take a large protein molecule, which could be a thousand different atoms, and I put it on a plant, it's useless, absolutely useless. Plant cannot use that. Now, that protein may have some nitrogen in it, and almost all protein does. It may have some sulfur in it. So it's got the good stuff in there, but a plant can't use it until that protein gets decomposed down to nitrates and sulfates. Okay. And what does all that? Well, it's all the bacteria and the fungi. That's what's degrading that protein. So that's why they're so critical in soil, right? They're, they're converting all this large organic matter, that banana peel and the flower that we dropped on there and the weed that I pulled and dropped on the soil. The bacteria are degrading that and converting it to nitrates and phosphates. Only then can plants use it. The nitrates and phosphates that come out of a bag of fertilizer are identical to what comes out of an organic organic source. So if I start with compost or a bag of synthetic fertilizer, before plants can use either one of those, they're identical. Absolutely the same. Okay. And many, many people think somehow 
if it comes from an organic source, it's somehow superior. It isn't. Bacteria don't care. They can't tell the difference. Plants can't tell the difference and labs can't tell the difference. So if I take a pile of compost and I decompose that, I digest it to release the nutrients so it's ready for plants, a lab cannot tell where it came from. It could have come from a bag of fertilizer. Okay, sense, but, yeah. but let me let me just finish the story yeah. here. So, because what I'm not saying is that these two sources are identical. What I'm saying is that the nutrients are identical. What people don't understand is that when I look at the synthetic bag of fertilizer, it has no carbon in there. It has no humus in there. And that's what we get from compost and manure. And that is critical for soil building, mm. right? So organic sources are much better, not because of the nutrients, but because of the or carbon that's in there and the organic material that's in there. That's what's so important for our soil. So if I choose between the two, the organic source is much superior, but not for the reason that most people think. Mm. Okay. When, yeah, when you break it down like that, that does make sense because that at um, when you when you break things down to their their smallest level, um, it's just molecules, atoms, and those little those small little bits and bobs that I don't know too much about because I don't have a background in chemistry. But that that is a, that is a really good um, distinction between the two, and that definitely. Um, Gave me some clarity on the difference. Yeah. The other, the other big thing about fertilizers, which, which I find amazing, is uh, people have absolutely no idea why and when to use fertilizers and what fertilizers to use. Mm. And, and I'm talking not, not you know, new gardeners here. I'm talking the gardening books, you know, 90% of the gardening books, 90% of the gardening blogs and YouTube channels and so on. They yeah. have no idea what fertilizer to use, okay? Many of the products on the market, the manufacturers of fertilizers, I don't know what they know, but based on the products they're giving us, they have no clue what fertilizer to, to use, okay? okay? And here's my here's a little example that you, the viewers can do. So let's say you're growing roses or tomatoes. Maybe most of the viewers grow vegetables for this group. So you're growing tomatoes and you want tomato fertilizer, right? So you go to the store, which in our case is gonna be online and Google tomato fertilizer and set it to get images. It's easier that way. Mm -hmm. Look at all the images. Every fertilizer has a different formulation. Hmm. Okay. Virtually everyone is different. Yeah. How can they all be perfect tomato fertilizers if they're all different. Yeah, they can't. They can't. At, at most, one is correct and the others are wrong. And it turns out even the one that you might think is correct is actually wrong too. Okay. And there's two main reasons why it's wrong. And you can do this with roses or tomatoes or whatever fertilizer you're, you're picking doesn't really matter they're just making formulations and, and putting names on the bottle. Those are not tomato fertilizers. The reason is there is no such thing as tomato fertilizer. Mm. And, and here's how I explain it. Let's say you and I both want to grow tomatoes. Okay. You get your soil tested and you're very low in nitrate. Mm. You got everything else, but you're low in nitrate. Yeah. I get my soil tested and I got lots of nitrogen, but I don't have any potassium. No. Are we going to use the same fertilizer to grow tomatoes? No. No. You need nitrogen. I need potassium. Yeah. So the key to this is that when we fertilize, and it doesn't matter whether this is organic or synthetic or anything else, when we want to add nutrients to the soil, we replace what's missing in the soil. Mm -hmm. We don't actually feed plants. Okay? If I have soil that has everything that plants need, I don't need to fertilize. I don't need to add anything. I can grow tomatoes. 
right? If I have soil that's deficient in one nutrient like potassium, I have to get some potassium in there. And then I look for a source of potassium. Right? Yeah. So we don't fertilize plants, we replace missing things in the soil. Yes. Right? And, and that's something very few people understand. Uh, fertilizer manufacturers certainly don't understand it. Uh, anyone who recommends a balanced fertilizer as the right, the best fertilizer hasn't got a clue what they're talking about. Uh, most of the NPK ratios on fertilizers are actually wrong for most plants. So if we're talking mm -hmm. about house plants or, or things in soilless mixes, for instance, they're completely mm -hmm. wrong. Um, and gardeners don't know what to buy because they don't know what's missing in their soil, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a gardener. I go to the store or I go online. I say, what fertilizer should I use to grow tomatoes? And I'll get answers. And they're all wrong because nobody knows what my soil is missing. Right? And it brings it back to the beginning of the discussion as well about actually understanding your own site specific context, context and, and soil type and knowing how to work from there and not forcing functions and, and fighting what your own uh, circumstances are. Right. So one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the options of course is I can get my soil tested all the time which I don't actually recommend people do. Um, the other option is use something like compost. Compost has pretty much everything you need. So if I put an inch of compost on my soil every year, I'm probably okay. So what I tell most gardeners is grow stuff, okay? If the stuff grows, you don't have a nutrient deficiency and you don't have to fertilize. Yeah. Now, get some organics in there, you know, some manure, some compost, whatever you can buy locally, because that means there's less transportation costs and, and mm -hmm. less pollution and so on. Doesn't matter what it is. It could be mushroom compost, like for Guelph, just a little bit outside of Guelph. We have mushroom growers, so we can get that mm -hmm. stuff cheap. I can get horse manure locally. I can use that. Whatever it is, put a little bit of that in every year and forget about fertilizing. Yeah. Right. Again, I grow you know, including my vegetable garden, I grow like 3000 things. I don't fertilize anything. Right. And I don't have the world's greatest soil. It's not like, you know, I, I just lucked out and I got the best six acres in the world for growing stuff, but most plants are not that fussy. Yeah. And as long as I keep adding a little more organic in and I keep the organic I have and reincorporate it in the soil, it just starts going around in a cycle and I just have nutrient levels that are high enough that stuff grows. Yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much the main um, takeaway that we try and, and distill in, in the permaculture design course, at least in the soil section is like, regardless of what soil type you have, adding compost is, is probably gonna fix what you have, like increasing biodiversity, adding compost, um, mulch. Yeah. 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 It, it adds that, and the important part of that compost is not the nutrients, it's, it's really the, the humus part. Hmm. Um, by the way, humus, humus actually doesn't exist, but you'll have to go to my blog, gardenmist.com and, and read about that, but there's no such thing as humus. Although we do tend to use the term and most people understand it, so I, I tend to use it too, but there's no such thing as humus in the soil. Um, but that's the important part. That or that carbon material is what encourages all that soil life. They all live on it. Mm. And what we don't realize is that when I take an orange peel and, and drop it on the soil, microbes come along and, and eat it and they grow, mm. they prosper, they multiply. So now I have more microbes, but microbes don't live very long. So they die. Yeah. But dead, dead microbes is more organic food. So we're, we have this cycle going, right? The orange becomes bacteria and the bacteria die and they become fungi and the, the fungi die, they become more bacteria. And they just, it just goes around and around in a circle until a few nutrients drop out the bottom and plants pick those up. Right? I think but in that process is when we're building good soil. Yeah. It's that process both as it's going on and the result of it, that's healthy soil, right? So healthy soil is defined as something with 
a lot of biological activity, a lot of stuff growing there. And that includes plant roots. So plant roots, all the microbes, the insects, everything, the dewworms, everything that's in the soil is constantly being regenerated. And that's producing natural compost right in the soil. You don't have to add that once it gets going, right? Mm. So the compost is kind of like the starter to this whole cycle, cyclical process. Right? Yeah. And not only is compost good for the garden, but it reduces food waste at the home level too, which is pretty awesome if you're recycling or if you're composting veggie scraps. Um, before I do ask you more questions, and I imagine I would have an unlimited amount if we kept chatting. Um, uh, Mitch, do we have any audience questions in Google, in Google chat? I better pull up my email here. Um, looks like... Oh, wow. Okay. There's quite a few. There's quite a few audience questions. So we have um, a question from Ayla, a few questions from Ayla Fortin, actually. The first one is, I would like to know more about using mushrooms in soil remedi remediation. Could you comment on that a little bit? Well, I, I don't really have a lot of comments. Uh, I asked the question once, how easy is it to grow mushrooms in the garden? Like how easy is it to go out and get some mycelium and bring it home and put it in this garden? And I never really got a good answer to that. And, and when I'm looking for an answer, I'm looking for a scientific answer. I, I'm looking for a scientific article that says, you know, if you move these fungi, they will grow. Um, here's the problem with moving microbes around and that is that if they're in the area they will find your soil and grow if the soil is not suitable for them then they won't come you really don't have to move them around now i know you you can grow some fungi on on wood and and so on and there's there's a whole agriculture around that but in general I would just let nature bring them, okay? There's fungi spore everywhere. If they like your soil, they will find it and they will grow and you don't have to do anything about it. Yeah, I like that answer. Again, the mushrooms that want to grow will grow. Um, and Ayla, if you are looking at learning more specifically about um, mycological remediation, I'd encourage you to check out Paul Stamets. He's doing a lot of really, really awesome work in that field. Um, Ila has another question. Um, I used to work in a university greenhouse. I had issue with using inorganic fertilizers as I believe they burn the microbes in the soil. Do most organic fertilizers not kill the soil microbes? No, they don't. Hmm. In fact, when, I, when you take, in or, again, the first thing to understand is that there's no difference between inorganic fertilizers and organic fertilizers as far as the nutrients go, right? So they're identical. So we have a nitrate molecule from the compost and we have one from a bag of fertilizer and a bacteria comes along and looks at them, they're identical. If the one burns the microbes, the other one will too. Mm. If you believe that synthetic fertilizer harms microbes, then compost also harms microbes because they're identical. They both produce the same nitrate. So now where does this idea come from? Well, it's all about dose, right? If I take too much nitrate and put it on a bacteria, it'll kill it. Okay. If I take too much nitrogen and put it on the lawn, it will kill it. So it's a dose thing. Mm -hmm. If I add, so, in the old days, we knew that if you take your fertilizer and you fertilize your lawn and you put too much in a spot, it kills the grass. So we have this thing in our head that says synthetic fertilizers kill things. Mm. Well, they don't. In fact, if you monitor your microbes in soil, what happens is as soon as you fertilize with synthetic <laughs> fertilizer, you see this big spike in growth. The population increases because suddenly they have lots of food. Okay, the thing that keeps microbes from multiplying is a lack of food. So you just fed them, you get this big spike and that lasts for a while until the nutrients are used up and then that crashes and, and our population comes back down again. Mm -hmm. Now, 
So if I add too much, it harms them, but it doesn't matter whether it's synthetic, it's synthetic or organic. But if I had a small amount, it actually helps them grow. Hmm. And that's a big, that's a myth that 90% of the people out there don't understand. Yeah. And if you're looking to learn more garden myths, Robert has two books on garden myths, garden myths, book one and book two. Correct. Lots of garden myths to jump into. Another question, this one from Joshua Brown. Thanks for your question, Joshua. Just curious, but can planting certain types of plants change the soil towards alkalinity or acidity? Or is this simply, uh, ha or does this simply come down to what you add to the soil, i.e. compost and nutrients? So the answer to that is yes and no. So what's really interesting about plants is the rhizosphere. And I have a whole chapter, or at least a section. I think there's, it's a chapter in the book on the rhizosphere. So what plant roots do is they actually alter the pH around the roots in an area called the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is, is a very thin sliver of soil around the roots and they actually condition the pH. And the pH could be two pH units more acidic than the soil itself. And that's one of the reasons plants grow in, in alkaline soil. Plants should not grow in a pH of 7.4 because they can't get enough nutrients. But what actually happens is that the pH around the roots is actually around six. Hmm. That's why they grow, okay? So yes, plants definitely condition the pH of the soil. The problem now is that that's a very thin amount of soil you know, like it's a fraction of a fraction of the soil. The net effect on the whole soil system, the whole garden is zero. Okay. Hmm. And so this, this is again, one of these things that I, I keep telling people, don't try to change your, the pH of your soil. So let's take my soil here. It's a 7.4 pH. So it's slightly alkaline. Our soil has a lot of limestone in it. Uh, when rain comes through the sky, it picks up CO2, turns to carbonic acid. So when rain hits the ground, it's acidic. In fact, it's quite acidic. It's like a 5.5 pH. And that's without the pollution. Pollution can drop it even more. So rain is acidic. It's been falling on my soil for the last, I don't know how many million years. And I'm still alkaline. Hmm. So what effect do you think a few plants growing in there are going to have. They don't. And that includes things like pines. Everybody thinks pine needles are acidic and pines will adjust the soil and soil under pines is always acidic. That's a myth. Pine needles are not acidic. Pine soil under them is not acidic. Now, maybe over millions of years, they might be able to change the pH a little bit, but in the, the time frames we're talking about in gardening, no, soil doesn't change. No matter what you do, no matter what plants you grow there, it won't change. But on a microscopic level, plants actually adjust the pH around their roots. Wow, that definitely busted a few preconceptions I had. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Robert, and thanks, Joshua, for your question. Um, we got a question from Rebellious Rainbow Unicorn. Thanks for attending all of our live streams, Rebellious Rainbow Unicorn. We love having you. Um, does Robert have anything to say about Mel Bartholomew, the square foot gardener? Uh, yes. So I read his book. It's got to be 40 years ago, 45 years ago, whatever, when I first started gardening. And I thought, you know, there are some very interesting concepts in this book, but the whole square foot gardening movement, if you like, I, th I think is kind of silly, <laughs> okay? Yeah. But there's some key concepts in it. And if you distill those out, you want to use them. So the main concepts are plants can be planted closer together than you really think. Certainly closer together than agriculture does. So that's important. 
The second one is if we make really good soil, we can put things closer together and they still grow. This idea of making squares, one foot squares, I think is absolutely silly. Okay. And I've even seen products you can buy, they're plastic boxes with plastic things you, you snap in so you know exactly where the one foot squares are. And you know, it's, it's nine onions per square foot or whatever the rule is. You know, a tomato needs two square feet and so on. I, I think that's taken it to an extreme that's silly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of planting in beds instead of rows makes some sense. The idea of moving your rows closer together makes a lot of sense. And it turns out that when plants compete with each other, there is some competition amongst their roots and nutrients and water but most of the competition is actually above the soil and it has to do with light. So provided the plant still gets enough light, you can actually move them quite close together, provided there's enough nutrients and water in the soil. And in a lot of gardens, you would have that. So there's some very good concepts and, and there's some things I, I don't agree with. The other concept is, is that as soon as you go to square foot gardening, you automatically go to raised beds. And I think there's a place for raised beds. I think the world has gone nuts about raised beds. A lot of the new gardeners in the last two years think that that's the only way to garden is with raised beds. And by raised beds, I'm talking about what walled raised beds. So you have to have walls around them, okay? When I started gardening uh, many, many years ago, I used raised beds, but I didn't use walls. I just raised the soil up a little you know, maybe six inches, eight inches, whatever. I had wider beds. So I like beds that are three to four feet wide. I'm a pretty tall person, so I can easily reach in two feet from both sides. So four feet works. I made permanent pathways, which were small. That all makes sense. Yeah. To put walls around there doesn't really make a lot of sense. And what really bothers me is there's a lot of people who build these things three, four feet tall. And then they go, how do I fill this thing? I just phoned the guy who delivers soil and it's cost me like a thousand dollars to fill these boxes. Yeah. Well, now what do I do? Right? You don't need that. And everyone says, well, it's easier to garden, right? Because you don't have to bend over. Well, I, I thought about that last year and, and I, I actually... I didn't time it, but I kind of kept track of how much bending do I do to grow crops? Yeah. Okay. Well, when I prepare my bed, I use a rake, so I'm standing. Then I will bend over and make a little, little, uh, you know, um, trough and put my seeds in. Now I have to bend for that. Uh, weeding, I do a little bending, but I mulch a lot, so I don't have to do a lot of weeding. Harvesting a lot of things you harvest standing up. So peas and beans and tomatoes and, and uh, cucumbers are all on trellis. So I stand up for that. So I'm not bending over. The amount of bending you do in a garden is so little. Why would you spend hundreds of dollars to build a three foot high box? Okay. So that I'm against. So I think some of his ideas were very good and really important for gardeners, but the ideas are taken to an extreme that are kind of silly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm restricting myself from asking my own questions because there's more audience questions. Um, Love cat asks, what is the predator of spider mites? Sounds like she has, or he has a spider mite problem in the garden. I don't really know. Hmm. Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't worry too much about, the bugs in my garden they they just kind of take care of themselves so <laughs> I, I know that's a dumb answer but it's a good answer it, it, yeah. it is it, you have a lot if you get a lot of variation and so on uh, if i have a real important outbreak i will google it and find out what to do about it yeah. but for the most part i don't have those issues something comes and eats them and uh, i don't care what it is yeah you let nature do the work that way um, Freegan Dave Hartman. He's watched a lot of the live streams. Thanks for joining us again, Dave. 
Any comments on adding clay to decomposed granite soils? Uh, adding clay is rarely recommended. So I, I don't know what decomposed granite soil is, but people do add clay to very sandy soil. So the problem with sand and silt is that they have no C, what's called CEC. They, they don't have charges on the particles, so they don't hold nutrients. Clay holds nutrients. And that's the big advantage to clay. Mm. So adding some clay to sandy soil to me makes a lot of sense, although it's not generally done as a practice. Yeah. Uh, partly because you need a fair amount of it and you have to dig it in and, and so on. Um, but from a, from a scientific point of view, that does make some sense. The advantage of clay is that it holds on to nutrients. Sand and silt does not. Hmm. That's the big benefit to clay. On the topic of clay, um, my coworker and good friend Mitch here just bought his very first uh, property and he wants to start uh, his own um, black currant orchard. He does have pretty clay dominant soil. So he has a couple questions for you. Um, his first question is, have you ever grown black currants and what have been the complications, if any, or some things to, to think about if you've grown them? Uh, I've grown uh, white and red and my dad's always grown black. I think black tastes awful. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're great in jam. So as once they're the processed, they're yeah. great. As, as a raw fruit, there's something about them I hate but I do grow white and red ones yeah. and we have clay soil around here and they grow quite well. So currants do quite well here. They're relatively easy to grow. Nice. Yeah. Mitch is very thankful for, for your answer. Um, next question again from Mitch, I think eight inches of mulch with a cardboard lining and a no mulch system over a swampy high clay content. Will it work? Sorry, what is that? Eight inches of mulch over cardboard? Yeah, I think he's wanting to do like um, a lasagna garden. Well, it, it wasn't Mitch, but it was a, a question from kind of a lasagna garden. I think perhaps. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, will, will it work? I mean, um, if you put eight inches of mulch on most areas, you don't need the cardboard. So... A lot of the, this idea of lasagna gardening, again, is one of these that is a pretty good idea, except it's been um, blown out of proportion. So the technique of lasagna gardening works to kill off the original vegetation, right? So you're starting a new garden, you've got weeds or you've got lawn or whatever, and you got to get rid of that to start your garden. Putting down paper or cardboard and putting some something on top, soil, compost, whatever, uh, it does work because you keep the light out, you kill the plants, and then you can garden. Yeah. Um, personally, I, I hate cardboard because it takes way too long to decompose, particularly in colder climates. So if I'm in Florida, maybe that works great. But in Canada, cardboard will be around for at least a year. Mm. Okay, we've done that at a, a garden at the University of Guelph. A year later, I went to actually look at it. All the cardboard was still there. So I would use newspaper. But if I put eight inches of something on top, I probably don't even need it because that eight inches is going to kill everything underneath it, right? I mean, there's a few things that won't kill, but nothing's going to kill that anyways, even the cardboard's not. So things like bindweed and canna thistle will still grow through it, but they grow through everything, right? The majority of things will be killed with eight inches of compost or eight inches of soil. I'd leave the paper out in that case. That's a pretty good helping of, of mulch. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, uh, whoever that was, for your question. Um, I have one final question for you, and then we're going to do the book giveaway, and we're going to let you go. This is a question that Mitch has been asking all the previous authors that I think is a really good one. And um, let's imagine that you were just made Education Minister of Canada, and your, your job is to assign um, high school graduates with a reading list of one to three books of your choice. Hmm. What books do you think they should read? Oh, well, 
Um, I'm going to surprise you a little bit, but I wouldn't get them to read any gardening books if I could only pick three books. Okay. Um, I think that the whole education system needs to be changed yeah. and we need to drop half the subjects we teach, particularly in high school. And we need to focus on a lot more science, things like logic, things like business. And the one course I would definitely insist that everybody take from a fairly early age is what I would call life skills. Yeah. I see. Okay. And I think the biggest mistake we make in education is the life skills. And there's there, that covers a wide range. For instance, in today's society, most people are getting their information online. We need to teach people how to filter through the nonsense. Yeah. How do you tell what information is correct? Uh, I see so much harm being done. And this goes in gardening as well as other subjects. So much harm is being done because people are getting stupid information on the internet. And the reason is we don't teach people how to filter it through. So that's one life skill that, that you know, today is critical. But other life skills, like how do you buy property? How do you manage money? My background is more in business and marketing. Yeah. And um, uh, for, for instance, I, I think everybody, everybody that's my age should, should be fairly wealthy and could be fairly wealthy if they actually learned some things way back when yeah. and made the right, made different choices, right? So I would teach that. I think life skills um, is the most important course we could teach. And that will include things about the environment. It would include biology. Um, and I would insist everybody take much more science because to understand any of this stuff, you need some science. And unfortunately, most people shy away from it. And we, we should, that should be a core subject for people. And yet we teach a lot of other things which really aren't that useful in life. So my big subject is life skills. Core subject every year, all through high school. What about, uh, what about books now? Um, well, you got me on the books. See, I know mostly gardening books and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really recommend those. <laughs> what have been some of um, your favorite books over? Well, you know, I like Lee Reich's books. He had an older one that was called something like The Weedless Garden which I've read numerous times. And I think he's a great author. So Who is this author? really anything by Lee Reich. Oh yes, yeah, you mentioned uh, him. R-E-I-C-H. And I, I really love that book. I still have it. I've had it for, for 20, 30 years. Um, so that would be one book I would recommend. And then Soil Science for Gardeners is a great book too. Yeah. I can't say that I've read the whole book, but I have, I have skimmed through it and it is a good book for anybody interested in getting it. And, it's, and there's another one coming in the series, actually. So the plan is for a series of four books now, uh, four or five, and there's another one in the series that's in the works. So, Perfect. Do you have any other um, news, updates, projects, anything else that you want to let the audience know? Um, well, I'm actively working on uh, YouTube channels. Um, we, the blog, Garden Messes, we're trying to work on that as much as possible. Um, but the YouTube channel is taking a lot of the time now. Mm. Um, cool. Well, we do have um, one lucky winner who is going to win a copy of your book. And Mitch has been managing the chat and he has told me that that winner is, who was it? Oh no, I could have sworn it was right in here. Winner of the book is Love Cat. So Love Cat, wherever you are, um, email info at verge permaculture. .ca. I'm putting this in the chat right now and we will be sure to 
get you your prize. Um, my focus is a bit sl split right now between Robert and the chat because Mitch has just stepped away. Um, but thank you so much, Robert, for, for taking the time and joining me today. I know I've learned a bunch of stuff. I hope all of you guys in the audience have learned a bunch. Um, if you know anybody who wants to listen to this conversation, it's going to be up on our YouTube channel for as long as our YouTube channel is alive. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to um, expand ideas on The Verge and maybe take it into a podcast in the future. So hopefully it will be available on more platforms. And um, that's everything. That's everything I got for you guys today. Thanks again, right. Robert. Well, thanks very much for having me and uh, good gardening to everyone who's listening. Yes. Good gardening indeed. Bye, Bye. Robert. Bye everybody on YouTube.